Welcome back to Turning Hard Times is Good Times. I am your host, Jerry Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have Alistair McLeod with us once again. As most of you know by now, Alistair is the head of research at Gold Money, uh, and you can read his very insightful weekly commentaries at goldmoney.com, goldmoney.com, and uh, I believe they usually puts them out about the middle of the week or so. Um, he's Alistair is with me today to talk about some of the very dangerous market conditions that are swirling around us uh, during this Chinese virus pandemic intentionally, I would suggest intentionally named COVID-19 to disguise its origins, but that's another issue I suppose we shouldn't venture into uh, on this show. Uh, but but it, deceit and deception is certainly the world of politics, and no matter what area of your life you're talking about, our focus here is mostly on economics and the markets, uh, so uh, that's what we'll stick to. Uh, there, Really, when it comes to Looking at the dangers, uh, understanding the markets, I don't know of anybody I trust more than Alistair McLeod, which is one of the reasons he is one of our most frequent guests here. Thanks for joining joining me again, Alistair. That's my pleasure, Jay. So good to talk to you. Always good to have you. And I know you're certainly one of the more popular guests on our show. So I, I'd, I'd like to um, focus on, I think it was your April 9th uh, missive uh, titled The Looming Derivative Well, actually, it had to do with the the destruction of bank credit, I guess. That's what the destructive forces of bank credit. Then I'd like to get to one you wrote later, uh, more recently, I think, April 16th. That's the looming derivative crisis, if we can venture into that one a little bit as well and how it might impact the gold prices uh, that we're looking at every day. But but going to your uh, April 9th missive – in, that, in the overview of that article, you, stay, you started out by saying, and I quote, commentators routinely confuse the deflationary effects of a contraction of bank credit with the inflationary effects of central bank policies designed to offset it. Central banks always ensure their stimulus is greater, so inflation, not deflation, is always the outcome, end of quote. Well, I'm certainly in complete agreement with that, but in looking back at the results of 2008, you know, most people believe the central banks actually allowed us to survive that very scary event, uh, and that the fiat monetary system is, is you know, if you believe what you're told, alive and well, nothing too much to worry about there. The banks are supposedly very well uh, capitalized this time around, so never need to worry. Uh, but, of course, it's not always that simple, and what we're told on the surface is one thing. But can you explain... Why do you think most people believe, other than just propaganda? I mean, what, where are they going wrong? Why are the commentators wrong in suggesting that everything is honky-dory? Well, uh, you referred to the 2008 crisis, um, and certainly the American banks are better capitalized. But you've only got to look and see what the bank position is in Europe to realize that actually Europe is very dangerous. I mean, what they call globally systemically important banks, the GSIBs, the very big banks, the ones which cannot under any circumstances be allowed to fail, uh, are meant to have buffers. But if you look at Deutsche Bank, uh, the um, balance sheet is 22 times shareholders' funds. Mm. You look at Barclays in the UK, 22 times shareholders' funds. You look at UBS in Switzerland, 17 times shareholders' funds. These major banks are undercapitalized. They cannot absorb much in the way of losses. And that is the problem. When bankers are greedy and everything's going nice and hunky-dory, then they will expand their balance sheets. They will take on extra risk because you have extra risk, you get better margins. Uh, And that is a process that accumulates over the credit cycle. But then you get to a point where it all starts going wrong. And we saw this uh, with uh, liquidity problems arising last September. Now, this is some four or five months before the COVID Mm -hmm. crisis actually hit us. So we were already running into, uh, if you like, a bank lending problem. The banks were beginning to be reluctant to lend. And when they start, uh, let's say, uh, they stop looking at, uh, you know, the profits that they can make by expanding their balance sheet and they're greedy for that money. When they turn around and say, we're worried about risk, then, you know, what really informs them is 
22 times shareholders' capital. You know, the gearing works in reverse. If you lose, um, I mean, look at Deutsche Bank. If they were to lose 4% of their assets, their shareholders would be wiped out. Uh, and uh, the same with Barclays. And nearly the same with UBS. So you can see how bank directors can literally turn on a dime from greed to abject fear. And that is actually what we're trying to deal with. Uh, and while that's happening, of course, the Fed and other central banks have this COVID crisis suddenly foisted upon them. They're trying to get money into the payments chains. They're trying to stop industry from falling over. And of course, they expect the banks to transmit the money to these people, but the banks are reluctant to do it. So you've got this this uh, problem that the Fed wants to expand the quantity of money, which it will do come hell or high water. And the banks are reluctant to transmit it to uh, their riskier customers. So, you know, the small and medium sized enterprises that banks lend money to mm -hmm. are not really going to get that money easily, which is intended for them from the central banks. And it's not just the Fed, it's the ECB, it's the Bank of England, it's the Bank of Japan, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Alistair, can't they? I mean, one of the things that that they're trying to do here, and I presume in other Western countries as well, is to uh, directly put money into the bank accounts of citizens. Um, you know, we're seeing, uh, I don't know how many billions of dollars already are being transferred to small businesses. I think today there's supposed to be a second part to that, uh, another, I don't know how many untold billions of dollars that are being transferred right into the bank accounts. And I know that, um, you know, people that we know have gotten their $1,200 per person into their bank account already. Uh, is, is, is that one way around? I mean, you're saying you can put the money into the banks, but the banks don't really want to lend to people that don't have jobs, to companies that don't have any revenues. So is the, is the way to do it then, the way they're trying to do it, to get around it, is to just put money directly into the hands of individuals, and why can't they do that in unlimited amounts? I, I think we're looking at two slightly different issues here. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the banks are concerned, if someone, let's say a small business, and let's, let's keep individual people out to one side for the second, but if a small business owes the bank money and the bank sees increased risk in the business environment, mm -hmm. then any money that is given to the bank to pass on to that business, as far as the bank is concerned, thank goodness for that, we've got our money back goodbye. Ah. So that's the first problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at individuals and this gets us into a completely different problem. We're talking helicoptering money. Right. And uh, so if you get a family of four, there's $1,200 per mm -hmm. adult and then there's an extra thousand dollars for two children. So, you know, this is this money is lovely because what it means is that, uh, you know, whereas the family was living paycheck paycheck to paycheck they've just got that little bit of room but where do they expend spend it i mean the answer has to be the only thing they can spend it is on the shops that are open and these are for necessities these are for food yeah, right. and things like that but we have a problem with food and that is that the supply chains uh, are not working i mean i hear that some extraordinary amount of milk is being dumped by american farmers because they can't get it to market you've got um you know sort of Meat packing sheds uh, can't uh, send out meat because they haven't got the packing uh, stuff, if you like, to mm -hmm. pack all the all the meat in. You, mm -hmm. you know, so you've got supply chain disruption, mm -hmm. uh, not only undermining, you know, sort of electronics and motor cars and so on, but the whole of the food processing uh, uh, industry. And so you've got a combination of money being focused spending money being focused on that industry and at the same time the industry unable to de deliver so what happens to food prices well no prizes for guessing they go up and not only do they go up but they go up quite a lot and they continue to rise and uh, this is a problem i think which uh, is going to be uh, very much center stage in the coming weeks and of course the politicians always take the line of least resistance. They say, well, you know, we must stop businesses uh, profiteering from people's misery. So, um, you know, any business that's profiteering, we will go out and hit them over the head. Yeah. Or alternatively, you know, the next stage is they turn around and they say, we are going to put price controls on so that right. businesses can't profit. And then you're into the familiar 
um, territory, if you like, of just destroying the whole delivery process <laughs> because yeah. after all i mean prices are the result of the balance of supply and demand and if you've already screwed it up then you know sorry government but it's down to you it's not not down to the market and uh, to try and uh, whip the market you know treat the market as a whipping boy as we know going all the way back to diocletian who wrote price edicts in stone and mm -hmm. in about i think it was 230 a.d and uh, the result was start mass starvation um because nobody would uh, dare um uh, you know sell food to the public um in case they were accused of profiteering so shops shut down people had to leave the cities and they went into the country and foraged <laughs> and yeah. you know but we forget these lessons of history. I'm afraid we, we do. And the, and the very simple uh, the very simple laws of supply and demand. You know, uh, price gouging is the first term you hear all the time during situations, whether it's a hurricane or one thing or another, and people. And you know what? What I think that's so so short sighted. Sure, I guess there are people that will take advantage of other people. That's that's unfortunate. But at the same time, to get people to do things that are difficult. Sometimes you have to give them a, a monetary incentive, and there has to be – you certainly don't ask people to go – you can't force people to go out and do things that are costly to them um, if you're going to have free will. And that's what I worry about most, Alistair, coming out of this environment is a lack of our freedom or a lack of our ability to act in accordance with our own, with our own needs uh, and do it civilly anyway. But I, I think you would agree that this – I mean this – we're facing something that's potentially much more – much more damaging, much more long-lasting and, and difficult than 2008, right? Uh, yes, of that there is no doubt. Um, I, I reckon that before this virus uh, shut everything down, we were already heading for uh, something on the scale of the Depression uh, of the 30s, preceded by a collapse uh, of Wall Street when it lost 90% of its value between October right. 1929 and 1932. Um, I'm not going to go over that ground again, because I think your regular listeners are probably aware of my views mm -hmm. on that. Um, what the virus has done is it's actually brought forward a lot of the problems which are already in the system. Right. And, and uh, of course, the Fed's only response to this, having reduced interest rates to zero actually before this happened um, with uh, the yield on uh, US Treasury debt under 1% for everything but the 30-year uh, bond with uh, negative yields throughout Europe and all the rest of it uh, there is only one tool in the monetary box that the central banks have and that is to print 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 the amount of printing that they um, uh, are about to embark on. I mean, they've already made the, the announcement that they'll do whatever it takes or mm -hmm. it will be infinite. Um, but the amount that's required basically is the amount that's required to ensure that bond yields do not rise and that um, financial uh, markets, financial assets do not lose value. They are going to try and support the whole of the market system because if that goes then they will have lost and they will trash the currency in an effort to do it now the last time and i think i'm probably repeating myself from an earlier uh, um, uh, 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 broadcast with you yeah. the last time this really happened was john law mm -hmm. france 1720 and um, the mississippi venture and yes. what he did was uh, in order to support the shares of his Mississippi venture, uh, he um, had to print and print and print money to buy those shares. He ended up not supporting the shares. That, that, that overwhelmed him, and uh, he ended up trashing the currency. So by around about February, when uh, the merger of the Mississippi shares with the Banque Royale was due to happen uh, to the final demise of the whole system and the worthlessness of the currency took seven months. Mm. Now, this is interesting because, um, uh, you know, if you really look at the way inflations uh, progress, uh, 
um, of a fiat currency, you have a long phase, mm -hmm. which can be many decades or it can be, say, four or five years mm -hmm. of um, a gradual loss of purchasing power of the currency. Now, the currency might lose um, 99 percent of its purchasing power in that period. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, then you get a second phase, and that is when the people who use the currency wake up to what's going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. It's not prices that are rising, but the value or the purchasing power of the currency that is going to hell. And when they wake up to that, there is nothing a government can do really within reason uh, to, to stop the complete collapse of the currency. Yeah. So this is where we are. We are where John Law was in February 1720. Um, we are 300 years on plus a month or two. <laughs> and, and it looks to me as if we will be extremely lucky to have a fiat currency system operative by the end of this calendar year. Oh, that's uh, that's that's pretty dire, I think, because in the meantime, you know that politicians are going to do uh, things that aren't within reason to try to hold it together. I mean, I, I don't know if it's the John Law incident or uh, in France, uh, I think sometime bef maybe before the revolution uh, took place. In fact, there was a, a situation where the currency was getting out of hand. It was a, a hyperinflating and the farmers demanded gold. As I recall reading that farmers demanded gold for their payment rather than the fiat and the government turned around, and anybody that owned gold was beheaded. I think, if I if I have the story right. So that was, people, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, that 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 was. I think you're referring to uh, the currency situation at the time of the revolution, which was when yeah. uh, the French government issued a new currency called the Assigna. Yes. And this theor theoretically was uh, secured on property that the state had stolen from the Catholic Church. Sorry, sequestered from the Catholic yes. Church. <laughs> um, and, uh, of course, like every government before and since, when they had this means of issuing something that got revenue in, um, uh, they issued some more and some more and some more. So they collapsed the, uh, they, co they collapsed the Asinia. And then they had another bright idea. Well, have a reset. Let's have a monetary reset. Mm -hmm. We'll issue... Some, a new a new paper called Mandat Territorio, uh -huh. and the Mandat Territorio lasted six months before mm. it just went. Yeah. <laughs> so they well, went I, through two hyperinflations in the and in, in the space of um, less than a year. Yeah. Well, I hear them talking about resets. Uh, James Rickards is my guest next week, and he talks about a monetary reset with SDRs uh, through the IMF. I think he thinks that's what they might try next. Any any ideas? Any any notion about that? Well, it's just fiat in another guise. I yeah. mean, it's, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I know James has uh, long thought that uh -huh. uh, this, this would happen. Um, and he's probably closer to the people, if you like, in the United States um, uh, that will establishment, make it yeah. you know, who, who, who would be thinking this way. Mm -hmm. But it won't last. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they could well try it, but it's just another form of fiat. Um, yeah. I mean, what, it, what is an SDR? It's a bunch of fits. And yeah, that's it's it. a bunch of fits. What do yeah. they attach, attach some gold to it too, possibly? Well, I think I'm right in saying, uh, I'm not entirely confident of this, but I think I'm right in saying that uh, anyone um, who uh, is, any currency which is part of um, uh, the SDR, the rules are that they cannot attach themselves to gold in any that's, way. Yeah, I believe that's I believe that's correct. Well, Alistair, in your article, you talked about uh, you said that um, the banks the, the, there's going to be a lot of bank failures over the next number of months. You believe, yeah, but that those that will survive will need to expand bank credit anew to buy up physical, tangible assets instead of their normal financial fare. So I guess by that you probably would start out with gold and silver, perhaps, or, or what? What do you have in mind there when yeah, you say well, financial I was, assets? I, I was being slightly cheeky on that because I think the one thing that uh, will go is all financial assets, mm -hmm. bonds, equities, and all the rest of it. They will be valueless. I mean, well, they're bound to be valueless if you can't value them in a currency which has got no value. Sort right, of thing. right. So and right. In, in, any, in any event, the, the bond story is, I mean, that's, that is just bad money. It's just going to go. Um, the, if you were, you know, if you, if you sort of want to profit out of this situation, then what you've got to look at is not financial assets, but real assets. 
So what you do is, at this stage, you probably um, have gold. Mm -hmm. You might even go to the bank and say, right, I want a fixed term loan for two years. What's the interest rate going to be? Mm -hmm. Put up whatever collateral. Da -da -da -da. You're borrowing in fiat. You know it's going to be uh, valueless when you come to repay it. Mm -hmm. So you take that fiat, buy gold, sit mm -hmm. on it, wait. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that when people are in real distress, then they will sell you their physical assets for a real knockdown price. And uh, there was a very interesting passage, which I'm quoting in my next uh, article, which is due out this uh, Thursday, Thursday mm -hmm. afternoon, uh, uh, about what happened in Austria. Um, I mean, you know, they had their inflation slightly ahead of the German inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, um, you know, People were staying in really smart hotels for nothing in their mm -hmm. own currencies. Mm -hmm. um, and when Germany uh, went belly up uh, with their inflation slightly afterwards, um, this uh, author uh, quotes uh, $100, which, of course, was backed by gold at that time, could buy you a street of six story houses in a major city. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> That's the way to be. And yeah. uh, the model, if you like, was a chap called Hugo Stinnis. Now, Hugo Stinnis was known as the inflation king. He borrowed money hand over fist to buy real assets. He bought factories. He bought country states. He brought, um, you know, all sorts of things like that. You know, the, the real stuff, nothing financial. He ended up owning about a quarter of Germany uh, mm -hmm. when, when the whole thing um blew up in uh, the November uh, 1923. Unfortunately, he didn't live, live very long to uh, enjoy it because he, right. died on the, he died on the operating table having yeah. an operation, I think, yeah. called Goldstones uh, the following year. But it shows you how to play the game, yeah. how to rob people, right. how, to, how to work with the inflation to rob people right. of their assets. I'm what afraid... So, so, Alistair, do you think there are some banks that are lining themselves up in that regard now? Because I'm thinking that once you hyperinflate and the currency loses its value, they won't be able to print so easily to go out and buy those assets, right? Well, uh, no, they, they, uh, they will be able to print so long as there yeah. is a currency. Yeah. Um, and I would think that there are no bankers thinking on these lines yet. Uh-huh. But if I had to nominate a bank which is smart enough to do it, mm -hmm. I think it would probably be Goldman Sachs. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so there, there are hedge fund guys like Ray Dalio, for example, and a few others, I, I dare say, that are seeing the end game here or at least perceiving it's going to end badly for fiat. Uh, Dalio certainly is, is a believer in gold and, and talks about all the time you have to have some. Uh, so I, I would imagine there's, there's people that are playing this game right now borrowing in fiat have been borrowing in fiat and and did exactly what what you suggest they should do is buy buy gold and uh and then pay back with worthless money in the past in the future I, absolutely i mean there will be some people as you say who are already beginning to see this light now having said that i don't think they see it quite as starkly as i do Mm -hmm. um, because remember that all the hedge fund boys, all the banks, I mean, they only account in fiat. They only understand fiat. They don't really understand that gold is money. They mm -hmm. understand that gold has hedging properties, if you like, mm -hmm. without, without telling us what those are. Um, so it's going to be an interesting one. There would be a lot of education and I'm afraid an awful lot of pain yeah. for ordin ordinary people, which, which does upset me. It's going to be a painful education for ordinary people, which is what we, we try to help people on this show understand what's coming. And and speaking of uh, bankers that are hedging and so forth, they think they're hedging with paper gold, right? They're borrowing. They're, they're not buying and not really taking physical possession of gold. They think they can just go out and buy some futures contracts, some options contracts, and they think they actually own gold. Uh, but there's a lot of people, uh, gold bugs, that are suggesting that maybe one of these days these people are going to wake up and want to and not be content with paper, realizing what's headed their way, and might want to take actually take physical possession. And I believe, if, if I'm not wrong, a little bit of that may have started already. Well, 
Mm, yes, I think that is true because uh, it's becoming a lot more apparent that um, the currency is being debased. Fiat currency is being debased very rapidly. Uh, and uh, there's only one thing that can happen, and that is that sound money is, is where you should go. That is the refuge, and therefore people will buy gold. Now, having said that, the banks are accounting in fiat, as I said mm -hmm. earlier, and uh, they are still playing the fiat game and mm -hmm. they have got caught out. I mean, what's happened is that uh, the, if you like, bankers are now very, very worried, as I said earlier, about expanding their balance sheets. They want to mm -hmm. contract. So they're turning around to their bullion desks and saying, we, you know, they're either saying we want out of this game, mm -hmm. close down your positions, or they're saying reduce your positions. And uh, that means that all the bullion banks at the same time, because this is the feature of contracting bank credit, one banker does it, they all do it. They're all being told at the same time, we want to reduce our exposure in this market, or they're being told, we want out of this market. And this is creating a panic amongst the bullion banks. They're being forced to close down their positions, which is why you've got this extraordinary premium building up in the futures market compared with London. And I think um, when it comes to the price of gold in London, I wouldn't say that's the right price either, because the bullion banks are at both ends. And mm -hmm. uh, you can see that the LBMA and COMEX are trying to collude to keep the show on the road and to stop enormous losses accumulating in the hands of some of these banks. And I can tell you there are enormous losses accumulating in one or two of these banks. They really are very serious. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just uh, about a minute and a half left or so, Alistair. Help us understand this. The bankers, the bullion bankers, in order to get out of the business, what do they have to do? They have to close down their short positions. Okay, and that means they have to go out and buy gold then to repay their... Exactly. Or, or it's just paper, or it's just paper contracts. They don't have. Well, to. it's 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 paper contracts. But you see that you've you've also got a, another problem now, and that is, as we saw with the April contract, people are standing for delivery, which they can do under Comex uh -huh. rules. Uh -huh. Now, the next active month is June. Now, you might say that uh, with a premium on the June contract compared with spot in London, that nobody in their right minds is going to go and stand for delivery when the June no. contract matures but uh -huh. that assumes that the right price is the london price uh -huh. it's not it's not because of what's happening the central banks are telling us for goodness sake we're going to print as much money as we possibly can and there's no limit to it so we all know what's going to happen to the price of gold so if you've got a contract a june contract and you want to uh, you're wondering what to do with it you probably stand for delivery so this is going to be um, a very, very tough time for the COMEX market and the bullion banks that operate in it. So we should uh, we should see some much higher gold prices uh, denominated in dollars and other fiat, I guess, is what you're saying. Well, um, it, yes, I mean, from, from every angle. Um, yeah. I mean, basically what's happened is that the game has changed hugely. I mean, these, these boys are quite happy to, you know, sort of, if you like, uh, start from a – you know, an even position, run the price up, uh, get, you know, get all the speculators in, then crash the price, right. take the money off them, that game stopped, and they've yeah. got caught. So you, so you think that game is over now, Alistair? You think that's coming to an end, and, and we're going to see some real sparks flying now in the gold markets? All right. We'll have, to leave, we'll have to leave it go with that. Thank you so much again for being with us, Alistair. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for helping us understand these complicated markets. 